On this episode of the History We're Saving podcast, we're talking to a man who has been a lifelong student of nature and primitive lore. Growing up in the Piedmont of Georgia, he developed a love for the forest that has been enduring. Not only does he know about the native plants, their medicinal values, he knows the way of the people who lived on this land long before we were here. And today, he has devoted his life to f- passing that knowledge down and furthering his studies, making it available to all of us. A teacher, a guide. Please welcome Mark Warren from Medicine Bow up in the North Georgia mountains near Dahlonega. Mark, thanks for being here. Glad to have you on. Thank you for asking. I'm happy to do it. Uh, you have authored a number of books um, about the American wilderness. You've you've authored some books uh, on a subject that I love, which is Wyatt Earp. And I and you know they say you don't know someone until you sit down and have dinner with them. And I look forward uh, at some point, hopefully, to being able to do that with you because I just I I, I found your work and I thought this was so fascinating through a mutual friend. And it's uh, this is. If there ever was history worth saving, this is it, Mark. So thanks for coming on. Talk to me about your school and the work that you're doing up there. Well, Medicine Bow is an outdoor school, so my classroom is the forest. And I'm basically teaching the survival skills that were perfected by the Cherokees because they lived here. And their relationship with the forest was a very intimate one because they understood, of course, where everything came from that they used, as opposed to the way we are when we sit down to a meal these days. We we really have no clue most of the time where the individual things came from that we're eating. But the intimacy uh, between man and the forest uh, in the Cherokee times is a great inspiration for me, and I really enjoy opening the doors or uh, maybe showing people uh, the way to a door, which turns out to be their personal door. You know, everybody has their own relationship with nature. I don't want anyone to try to emulate mine, but if mine can inspire, then so be it. But uh, I love the fact that all the individuals of the world can have their own unique relationship with nature, and it's just waiting there for people to approach. You know, that is so uh, teach, that is a beautiful statement. <laughs> I teach uh, some of the following skills, how to read the earth in terms of tracking, uh, to identify animals and what they're doing when you see the tracks in a certain format. I teach stalking, which is the stealthy approach to animals that the Cherokees use, which is a very much like a martial arts discipline. The foundation of everything that I teach, I believe, is plant study, because uh, once you address that study, you get this tremendous boost in all the other categories of things like creating fire, um, knowing how to make the crafts, because you have to know the plants in order to do that. And when you learn about plants, you learn about animals. If you're studying a plant, you're going to see tracks there. You're going to know what animals are enjoying that as a food or maybe as a, as a place to bed down. You began your studies at the University of Georgia uh, studying chemistry pre-med, and I guess uh, from that, that sort of led you uh, into the naturalist uh, lifestyle. How has modern medicine Maybe I don't want to say gotten it wrong, but 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 where did the two part? Well, uh, you know, there are a lot of people today who feel that medicinal use of herbs that are around us is a chancy thing or maybe a, a new age thing or uh, something that holds lots of folklorish mistakes. And that's all very true because folklore seems to just take over in this area and it just has a lot of momentum
the medicines are out there and if one knows how to use them uh, they can be a, of a tremendous advantage to someone you know here's a simple one for example uh, insect repellency most people don't consider that to be probably a a big factor but if you're in the southeast of the United States in the summer and if you had to stay out unexpectedly overnight and you decided to pile up in a big bunch of leaves to stay warm you're going to be one miserable person the next day from chigger bites and for folks who don't know what a chigger is uh, come down and visit us in Georgia sometime <laughs> the little right. mite that creates a, a, a ferocious itch <laughs> And uh, just to have a dozen of those could literally break someone's morale for doing the things I needed to do. So medicines are there. I teach them from the survival aspect, meaning I'm not an herbalist who collects and has an apothecary of, of stored herbs. I use things as I need them, and I think of the forest as the repository, the pharmacy or, or maybe the supply store to get those things. I would never um, be degrading toward modern modern medicine. I have a great respect for all the research that's happened. I think every one of us has stories of how we benefit from that. But we have gotten into a mode of thinking that um, is kind of typical of, I guess, of the American psyche, and that's uh, let's make things happen very fast and do it radically. and. And so medicine can be abused, of course, in that way. Um, but again, I'm in great respect of the, the scientists and those who have uh, pioneered cures and treatments and techniques of surgery or whatever. I, I'm gr really grateful to be living in that age. We talk about food, and I, we, we, this goes back to Hippocrates saying food is medicine. Uh, yes. we, we talk about medicine, and we think of modern pharmacology. And it's so critical to understand as, as we progress, not only in society, uh, but, it, but it's important to look back at these, at these people who came before us and realize that, hey, well, they might not have had modern drugs like penicillin and antibiotics and all this other stuff. They lived quite well, and they, they did have an understanding of what nature has to offer, as you say, in the forest, in the repository. What, what can we do if, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're someone that, that is living in the city, uh, if, you're, if you're in an apartment, if you're in a high-rise, at that granular level, what, what is something that... that you can do even in that situation to benefit from this knowledge well no matter where you live you're even in a city uh, such as atlanta you know uh, you've flown over atlanta before you look down at it it's surprising how many trees you see there's there's lots of of pockets of forest in the atlanta area and there are lots of parks and anyone could go to one of these parks and if they're willing to begin the study of plants, they can benefit from that area. But it is very academic. Uh, it takes a dedication to do it because uh, anthropologists tell us today that all paleo humans were born with the instincts of how to use all the plants. And that's hard for many people to believe. That sounds like a fantastic statement, but it is true. And we have lost the instincts over time as our culture has become more and more refined. And it's interesting that one of the key factors in dulling our instincts has been the development of language. It seems that the more we can talk about something, the less we actually do things. And so we have to go at this purely as students from the beginning. and. And this is one of those studies where being exacting is a necessity because you cannot experiment with things that you put into your mouth. You've got to know what you're doing. So thankfully there are, there are good 
uh, sources for learning the plants in that way. And just like people learn when they come here to Medicine Bow, this, I always advise them to first address plant study before you go to the other areas like fire making or archery or whatever, because uh, all of those things depend upon plant knowledge. Yeah, I was just going through some of your courses here uh, that you do offer at Medicine Bow. Uh, one of the ones that jumps out after all of these, you scroll down this this large list. And by the way, it's medicinebow.net uh, if you're curious. We'll quick link that into the show story. But one of these uh, courses that I just think is, is great that you offer is the Old West Peace Officer. <laughs> Yeah. Now, this seems that like a departure, appears Mark. Come, <laughs> that appears to come out of nowhere on that list, doesn't <laughs> right, it? Right, it does. <laughs> That's yeah. simply my own personal interest. Uh, when I was seven years old, I got hooked on that history. And, you know, I grew up in the time of... Uh, I looked this up just the other day. There were 134 Westerns that debuted on television it, just in a few a span of a few years. It, that's all that was on television at one time. So kids my age, all of us got interested in the Old West, and I started looking into its real history when I was quite young. And the first book that I read on it was about Wyatt Earp. Little did I know that that, that so-called biography was full of fiction. And so I've spent my life uh, learning the truth about it. I've made uh, some wonderful friends who are the just the tops in Western research, and the men who have put out the best books on these. Uh, I couldn't really contribute more than they have in the way of a biography, so I wrote a trilogy of historical fiction so that I could share the the sensual experiences, the the sounds, and the the tone of voice and what these people were thinking and, and to give the conversations that we really don't know exactly how they went, but we know they happened. So I used novelistic um, skills in developing the story as the best way that I knew it. Talk to me about what you hear and what you feel when you walk out into the forest. Now, after all of these years, what what do you experience in those well, first it's few a minutes? Well, difference from what I used to experience. When I was a little boy, I simply was smitten with the forest, and it was an aesthetic thing. I didn't know anything that I was looking at. I didn't know the different kinds of trees, even. I just wanted to go there and be part of it, and I felt like sometimes I pictured myself walking through the woods as if I were watching a movie. And I thought I was just walking through a masterpiece, as if I'd gone to the greatest museum of the world. And then as I learn more about it, when I go into the forest, uh, the, the great um, manifestation of surprise is all that time in the woods, I believed I was alone. I've never been alone in the forest. Even when I never see an animal, I'm not alone in the forest because now I know about, for example, how trees communicate with one another, both underground, through the root systems, using fungi that are attached, as well as through the air, using chemicals called pheromones. And we make pheromones ourselves. And experiments have shown that people's pheromones can affect the plants around them. And so why not vice versa? There's a two-way street going on here between yourself and plants. And, you know, the real trick is that you've got to look beyond the fact that all these plants appear basically stationary. Uh, They don't react to us visibly. They don't have body parts like ours until you really start studying the science of it and you realize how similar they are to us. So the the big change I would say, Matt, is that I never feel alone out in the forest now. I'm aware of the beings around me. And that's the the trees, that's the the animals and and everything that make it up. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's especially uh, eye-opening when you're in the presence of an animal. You're so aware then that you're in the presence of something alive, of course. But 
when you study plants more, you learn that same feeling about the plants. The Cherokees had a beautiful name for trees. They called them the standing people. And uh, everything that I've ever read about that by authors suggests that that's because trees stand so tall. But I feel convinced that it's something else. Uh, I know that the Cherokees did not know about molecules and uh, the chemicals that ran through trees and the and what was being made exactly in the tree leaf. But I'm convinced that they knew about the, the grand scheme of things, what was going on in the way of photosynthesis. They knew that trees were the receptors of energy from the sun and all the other green plants as well. And they understood that these were the middlemen and middlewomen in this whole equation of how we get energy. Every single thing we do, like right now, my talking on this telephone, it requires energy. It originated in the sun. And I could not get that without the agents of the trees working that for me and trapping it here on earth. So either I eat part of a green plant or I eat an animal that's eaten part of a green plant. That's the transfer of energy. I try to tell my wife that every time she says, did you have a vegetable today? You know, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And in, in, in the long way of doing it, perhaps I have. I've had yeah, quite a few, you okay. know. Yeah. You want, you want to call those French fries vegetables. That's right. right. <laughs> it, at one point it was a potato maybe, but no, I no. but that's so true. I mean, everything is interwoven and I, I hear what you're saying. When it's time for an adventure on the open highway, one quick call to American Family Insurance gets you headed in the right direction. Our travel peace of mind package is there if you encounter a bump in the road. From roadside assistance to rental car coverage, we have you covered. Find a local agent or get a quote at amfam.com. American Family Insurance. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, SI, and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, if folks cannot come to Dahlonega, which they really should, I mean, it's a quick trip uh, on an anywhere uh, that uh, <laughs> that an airliner flies. They all come to Atlanta eventually. Uh, and it's a quick drive up to the mountains there to come to your place. But uh, if they want to start out with a book, uh, you have so many different titles, Indigo Heaven, uh, Song of the Horseman. I mean, just to, to name a few, talk to me about where people should start. Is it wild plants and survival lore? Or what, where, where do you recommend they start in the Mark Warren Library? Um, well, it's becoming uh, more interactive with nature. I would suggest to them that they start with plants. And I have written a four-volume series on all of my teaching, and book one is all about plants and the process of how to go about identifying them, how to use a, a plant ID book, because everyone is going to need that at some point to do this, either that or you're going to have to be there in person with a teacher. But uh, volume one of my series called Secrets of the Forest, first that, and it gives activities for that reader to use with, say, their children or grandchildren or friends to help to really cement the ideas and to, to help get them more involved in it by having an actual hands-on project. I remember the first time, and it was probably uh, with Boy Scouts, but I remember the first time we were out in the woods and... We picked something up, and we ate it. And I remember this feeling, it's almost like you've robbed a bank. I've never robbed a bank, Mark, but it, <laughs> so you feel like you've, you feel like you've done something that, uh, like, oh my gosh, like, is this really, you know, is, can I really just do this? And today, when I'm in the woods, uh, you know, I, and I, when I wonder what something is, I find myself pulling out my, my smartphone and opening the you know the the plant id app or google lens and whatnot just because even though i think i know what it is from the guidebook i want further proof and you cannot be too sure you just no, can't you, you can you have to make a vow to yourself that you will never guess you have to be absolutely positive because there are definitely some dangers out there in the forest i mean just because something says all natural on the box you know 
that's not necessarily a safe thing. There are very dangerous chemicals that exist out in the woods. So. Well, and that yeah, brings me common. to what I was going to ask you. I mean, they, they tell you when you start studying any of this that medicinal plants are often the most poisonous <laughs> because it's sort of a double-edged sword with this stuff. I'll tell you something interesting about that. Um, all trees make food, it's a sugar, in their leaves. But they make a, a host of chemicals. And every species of tree has its own particular list. For example, a sweet gum tree growing right here at Medicine Bow is going to make the exact same chemicals that it makes down where you live in Carrollton, um, unless there's some anomaly about the soil here or there. So you've got all these plants that have these formulas of what they're going to make. But everything that they make in the leaf is not shared with the rest of the tree. The sugars certainly are, because that's got to be sent all the way down to the roots so that the roots have the energy to grow. And there are other things that are sent down like antibiotics or, or like salicylic acid that helps to keep it healthy and fresh. But certain chemicals are left in the leaves, and usually, these are the toxins to protect the leaves from being annihilated by insect attack of some kind. So that means that if you know how to access those tubes that carry sap down the tree, you can get to certain chemicals there that are not toxic. The toxins being left in the leaves. Now this doesn't mean that you can go to any tree and eat that layer, which is called the inner bark. But there are a number of trees that you can do that with as an emergency food. Hmm. But you, on the other hand, you could not eat their leaves. Yeah, every everything uh, everything has its purpose out there. Even as as unusual yeah. as it would sound to go, you know, eat a tree for dinner if you were in a you were in a pinch, and as you said, you knew with absolute certainty. Uh, there is a way to survive. Let's let's get into the idea here of of life in America in the 2020s. Uh, people seem to have this this curiosity right now. We hear about all of this uh, turmoil and. We hear about the unrest in the world and the rebalancing of powers and of all of this stuff that you just have to sort of filter out and turn off uh, at some point. But people have really taken an interest in this, uh, a renewed interest, and I'm sure it happens in every generation. What is, uh, what is your advice right now uh, for Americans in regard to your work and what you've done and where we're at at this moment? Well, I'll say this, that the, the COVID virus created an incredible boom in my business. <laughs> I've had more people trying to sign up for classes than ever before in my career. And I think what that's about is um, there's a, a crisis that comes and it just suddenly triggers people to feel, uh, okay, how well can I take care of myself if, if a worse scenario happens? This kind of thing happens every now and then, you know, and people feel alarmed about that. And that's when they realize that they have really led a life. I, I'm not speaking about everybody, of course, but the public at large, I think, has led a life removed from nature. Uh, I think for most people, nature is a backdrop. It makes a nice scene out the window. But there's no true involvement between the, the, the natural surroundings and the person. I often think of the history of the world as the evolution of comfort. And it makes perfect sense. Anybody would try to make a job a little easier. Uh, for example, if if a person learns how to spin a piece of wood in his or her hands on another slab of wood and create fire, it's a tremendous accomplishment and very 
rewarding internally and, and of course rewarding externally with heat and cooking potential and boiling water and whatever. But um, you, you figure out ways to make that easier because that's, that's a very taxing little job. So somebody invented what's called the bow drill, and it was the first power drill you, using a piece of cordage and a bowed stick to make the drill spin more easily. And then, of course, today we've got power drills. <laughs> you know, you could put a piece of wood in a power drill and make fire in seconds. So we make things more and more comfortable, but the downside of that is that it does remove us from nature. We really just don't have that connection anymore. And so, uh, again, my suggestion is always begin with the thing that's going to be there waiting for you to study, and that's the plants. I love it. I love it. Well, I said at some point, I hope I get to sit down and break wood with you. I, I said it differently earlier. I said, I hope we get to share a meal because you really don't right. know someone until you have a meal. Now I'm going to say, I hope we can break wood together at some point, Mark, and, okay. and figure this out. And listen, you, it's a fascinating, it is a fascinating study uh, that you offer there at Medicine Bow. Uh, you do have some courses coming up. I know you teach uh, and, and give workshops around uh, not only Georgia, but I would imagine you'd go just about anywhere someone would be willing to bring you to. Is well, the... I used to do that, but I've gotten older. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I did. And so <laughs> I'm not traveling as much as I used to. Yeah. I'm sticking pretty close to the mountains around North Georgia now. Well, I don't blame you. I think it's a gorgeous spot. And I, you know, I don't know why anybody would ever leave. But if you want to find out uh, more about Mark's work and where you could find him at a lecture perhaps or a workshop uh, just click on the quick link in the show story and visit medicinebow.net uh, and you can find out everything uh, about the coursework and then what's going on we're celebrating teachers on season five this is what it's all about right i mean if you if you can't survive if you can't have an understanding at least or an appreciation for nature much less an intimacy with it everything else is just uh it's 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 not even worth talking about yet i mean this is where it all begins yeah it is a good starting point and you know i don't expect everyone to want to become an expert survivalist uh I, that's really not my intent i believe that people benefit just uh by feeling good in the soul about being outside and kind of rediscovering that I think it's very healthy, and I mean literally healthy in a physical way. And uh, you know, I, I've spent a lot of my life canoeing, and you you make a, a lot of friends in that circle. You can get mm. to know a lot of different canoeists and kayakers and whatever. And it's so interesting to me that all of the old timers that I know look about 15 years younger than they are. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's got something to do with being on the river so much, I think. Yeah. Well, and, and all that all that cardio they're doing too, Mark. I mean, let's not sure. leave out the exercise portion of it. Sure. But you're right. Yeah, you're right. You don't see that with old fishermen who have lived near the sea. Uh, <laughs> they're on the water their whole lives and they look like a you know, they look like a piling on the side of the pier when they're done with it, cracked and <laughs> broken and you you do. You see that in the canoeist though. You see a, a vibrant almost dare I say happy person uh, that yeah. doesn't look worn by the winds and the and the seas talk to me about your latest book uh, you're, you're, you've got a new one coming out uh, what can folks expect in this new work uh, the one coming out now is called Last of the Pistoliers sounds like a western doesn't it no it's got a good it's name it's actually an eastern it's about this very county where I live Lumpkin County and it is a novel so it's fiction and it's about a school teacher, a history teacher in high school, who gets thrown into the role of county sheriff by uh, a story that I won't reveal right here. But it's about his learning uh, the underbelly of his old hometown, not mm -hmm. having known anything about the crime that went on. And, and he is a, he's an old school fella, and uh, he has a fascination with the Old West like I do. And so he has become quite adept with uh, the old cult peacemaker, and that's what he carries. And so it's a little bit about the anachronistic uh, love of the West being applied to modern crime. 
So this this will be my kind of detective book, I guess. Uh, first one I've written like that. I love the idea. Well, I think that's going to be fantastic. Listen, Mark, thank you for coming on, and I hope you'll come back at some point. I really do. I, it, It's great work that you're doing, and we can learn so much uh, from you, from your books, and, of course, from your courses there at Medicine Bow. I, I truly appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I'm happy to do it. I'm glad to join you anytime. Well, if you want to find out more about Mark and his work there at Medicine Bow, you can follow along on his website right there at medicinebow.net. And as always, we appreciate you being here on a History Worth Saving. Sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already done so. And we'll keep you abreast of uh, what's going on and who's coming on. If you want to hear all of our shows, you can always, of course, support this podcast by joining our exclusive content section. It's right there. It's $25 a year. You can hear the entire archive. And, of course, you get to hear all of the shows as they are produced and they become available. Thanks for being here. And, again, my appreciation to Mark Warren for coming on. So long for now, everyone. This is history worth saving.